do that. So let's dive in, right? What's in a name? Well, you'll note that uh, we're calling this work, and I know you know it because that's why you came in, uh, transforming the foundational post-secondary experience. I want to take some time defining key phrases and terms. For purposes of the work that we'll do together for the next five years, we're defining transforming as moving towards eliminating race, ethnicity, income, zip code as the best predictors of who can succeed, right? It would be wonderful if in five years we can totally eliminate that. I think it's more realistic to say it's moving towards eliminating that. In some instances, or if not some, all instances, you have been working towards this at the institution. So we want to put a heightened attention and heightened effort on just that, right? So that's how we're defining transforming. Again, moving towards eliminating race, ethnicity, income, and zip code is the best predictors of who succeeds. And then here's that other phrase, the longer phrase, the one that uh, uh, we're introducing to many of you or reintroducing to a lot of you, which is we're calling the foundational post-secondary experience. Some people have said, yeah, you've been doing the first year experience for years. Yeah, we have for 50 years for John, right? But it's not just the first year. We're defining the foundational post-secondary experience as the first two years, right? The first 60 credits in a semester system, first 90 credits in a quarter system, because some of you are on a quarter system, right? So let's be clear what we mean. And I'll spend some time focusing on why the foundational post-secondary experience matters. As a matter of fact, I'm going to do that right now. And the reason why I'm going to do that right now is because we're asking you to uh, reframe your thinking a bit, right? You have been rightly focusing on the first college year for some of you for the entirety of your career. So don't stop doing that. But we want you to broaden that focus, to expand that focus. We want you to reframe. Now, some of you um, who know me know that uh, I have um, the great privilege of working with um, Dr. Sarah Steinkotch, who is not just my partner in work, she's my partner in life. We've been together for um, 30 years now. And uh, right now we have the great privilege of um, making some modifications to our house because uh, we have six children, some of whom are in their 20s. We thought they'd leave. It turns out they don't. And um, we're literally adding a, a little bit of space and we're privileged to be able to do that. And as we're doing that, um, we're interacting with contractors and they keep telling us things like, well, you can't make that change because you have to change the roof line or you can't make that change unless you're willing to change this. Right. And so on one level, um, that serves as a wonderful metaphor for what we're trying to do with institutions. We will encounter the institutional equivalent of roof lines. We will encounter the institutional equivalents of foundations. And we just ask you to ask yourselves, what if you were to rebuild the foundational post-secondary experience so every student can graduate? You might have to change a roof line. You might have to move a foundation or pour new concrete, but you would do that so every student can graduate. You may discover that existing structures don't allow that to happen, right? So as Sarah and I go about talking with contractors, now some contractors come back and say, anything's possible if you have the money, right? And they mean that tongue in cheek, but they don't, right? We also know from our work, actually, Dr. Brent Drake got to be, uh, our senior vice president here at the Gardner Institute because of evaluation in part, because of evaluations he'd done for us, where he found that institutions always had the resources they needed to have to implement plans to a significant degree, a self-identified high degree. They had it within existing resources. They just had to be willing to reallocate those resources, right? So as Sarah and I are wrestling with, well, how are we going to build a house that serves our family, um, our, our uh, growing family moving forward. Uh, part of it is looking at existing resources. We're asking you to reframe, to look at the first two years and say what's possible utilizing, utilizing the resources we have to come up with a new design so every student can graduate. Now, I want to support the case that the first two years, not just the first year, but the first two years are pivotal in all this. So I'm going to go to two sets of uh, resources to make that case, right? The first is a uh, recent report. While it says fall 2015, uh, it is an analysis that came out in late 2021, early 2022 from the National Student Clearinghouse. 
looking at the fall 2015 cohort and really taking a look at uh, when they left, if they left, and when they completed, right? Uh, and I'll dig right in, and I'm going to say in advance two things. Number one, we'll make sure you have these slides. So if there's anything that I go into that uh, I feel, you feel like I glossed over, you wanted to dig in deeper, you have them, right? You can certainly go to the National Student Clearinghouse Report if you want that, but you'll get these slides as well. But what I'll also do uh, in an attempt to avoid the uh, violating the rules of PowerPoint is I uh, use um, circles and arrows and point you to the uh, key points that I really want to focus on. I want to start on this, uh, which is the uh, graduation rate for students moving across uh, the five to six years in the National Student Clearinghouse study. And you'll note that this dark green color is the grad rate for um, the students in that cohort, right? And you'll see that it goes up over time so that by 2020, 2021, the end of that academic year, 56% of the students graduated from the institution um, where they started previously in fall 2015, right? So just 56%, right? That yields a non-graduation rate of 43.4%. Now, there are other elements in this that we have to pay attention to, right? Uh, there's the light green, which is for students who transferred or graduated from another institution, right? And you'll see that that accounts for about 10.7% of the overall enrollment uh, five to six years later. And then there is the darker blue, which are enrolled, still enrolled at the starting institution. And uh, all the way five, six years later, there's still about 3% of the students. Um, and then there's a subset, light blue, that transferred and enrolled in another institution. And then there's that grayish, light gray, that's uh, not enrolled anywhere. So I want to focus on that group in particular, the not enrolled anywhere because by the second year or the end of the second, the start of the third year, 18.4% uh, of the overall student population that started in 2015 is not enrolled anywhere, right? 18.4%. And by the end of five to six years, it's almost 25%. So for me, what are the big takeaways? Well, one thing is I needed to calculate or wanted to calculate. Uh, the amount of loss that occurred in the first two years, right? And we can do that, again, which we're calling the foundational post-secondary experience, simply by taking the loss, uh, the students not enrolled anywhere, that 18.4%, dividing it by the total not enrolled anywhere uh, six years later, right? And that's just 18.4 divided by 24.9, right? Which comes up to roughly three quarters of the students who are not there six years later, were lost at institutions somewhere during the first two years, right? So the reason why we wanna focus on the first two years is because it counts for three quarters of the overall attrition. It's not that the other quarter doesn't matter, it definitely matters. But if we really wanna focus, you know, if we only have so much resource, so much, so much time, energy, and effort, you're going to want to focus where three quarters of the issue is, right? And that is in the foundational post-secondary experience. Now, there are some limits to um, the National Student Clearinghouse reports. And by the way, this is me just summarizing what I shared earlier, right? That 25% not being enrolled anywhere by uh, the uh, end of the first six-year period three quarters of that attrition occurs somewhere during the first two years. For context, uh, we are talking about 1.8 million students in this overall cohort who started, right? So when you are looking at attrition in the first two years, overall that 25% across six years is almost a half million students, 460,000, and a little over 300,000 of those students leave sometime during the first two years, right? But there again, there are limits to the NASA Student Clearinghouse Study. One of the big limits is that they do not disaggregate by race, ethnicity, by family income, right? By Pell status, we use that as a proxy for family income. By first generation status, right? We, we've, Brent and I have had a, a preliminary conversation with Doug Shapiro at the National Student Clearinghouse, uh, a good man. Um, and he's interested in uh, seeing how they could 
begin to disaggregate in some of this. And we're going to have a, a deeper chat with Doug over the weeks and months ahead to see, you know, if there's ways we can help shape and inform that. But here's some other news at the Gardner Institute. Uh, we've been collecting data from institutions that we work with. Uh, Dr. Monica Flippin Lynn has, uh, Wynn has been leading our retention performance management process for uh, uh, over three years now, and uh, that she knows that data is disaggregated by race, ethnicity, health status, as well as first gen status. And Brent was able to go dig into that data so we could take a, a more dis, uh, disaggregated look at the evidence and further make the case. Right. We do have data from 33 retention performance management institutions uh, that data that were submitted somewhere between 2011, 12 and 2020, 2021. Right. Uh, by and large, there's at least a rough overlap uh, with the National Student Clearinghouse data as well. Right? There are limits of the data. These are all four year institutions. It doesn't include community colleges in the mix. Uh, on the plus side, there's nearly 300,000 individual student records in the data. We could only look at enrollment within institutions. Uh, we couldn't see if they left and went somewhere else, right? Strength of National Student Clearinghouse, they had the broad whole higher ed view. Strength of ours, we could disaggregate by race, ethnicity, family income, things along those lines, right? But only within institutions themselves, not across institutions. I'm going to take a little bit of time focusing on what we found there, right? In terms of the aggregate retention and progression rate, uh, what we noticed is that 28% um, of the students were not enrolled after the first year at their initial institution, and that 40.5% uh, of the students were not enrolled at the end of the second year, right? So the foundational post-secondary experience, meaning that 59.5% were but almost two-fifths weren't, right? So there's a significant loss that goes on. When we go out by the sixth year, it's 53.3% who hadn't graduated by the end of the sixth year. So that allows us to basically say roughly, it mirrors some of what we found in the National Student Clearinghouse with the greatest amount of the attrition being accounted for in the first two years. So again, it reinforces if you really want to focus and zero in on the period, focus in on those, those first two years, first to second and second to third year uh, retention rates. This is where we can do some things that uh, the National Student Clearinghouse can't, right, or couldn't or doesn't in its current reports, right? Disaggregating by race, ethnicity. Uh, you'll note here that we disaggregate by the federal race, ethnicity uh, designations. We have American Indian or Alaska Native. We have Black, African-American, Hispanic, Latino, Native Hawaiian, other Pacific Islander, and uh, white students as well, right? As we disaggregate that, we note that uh, first to second year retention rates, approximately 45% of uh, African-American, uh, Latinx, and Native Hawaiian, uh, other Pacific and Islander are not at the original institution where they were enrolled from the first to the second year. And we also know that 62% of that uh, student or that student demographic is not enrolled at the end of the second year, right? So first to third year retention, right? Looking at the foundational post-secondary experience, uh, those student populations experience almost a 62% on average attrition rate. Uh, and that approximately 75% of those students do not graduate from the original institution six years later. Uh, that means 84% of that loss overall, if you amalgamate those three groups together, occurred sometime during the first three years at the institution. So if you're asking why we are emphasizing what we're emphasizing in the first two years, it's because it's the period of the greatest attrition, particularly for students of color. Uh, and I do want to share, by the way, it's also the period of greatest attrition for all students, right? It accounts for 85% of uh, uh, the uh, American Indian, 80% uh, of Black African American, 77% of Hispanic Latinx, 84% of Native Hawaiian, but it also accounts for 76%, almost 80% of white students, right? Even though white students have a significantly higher first to second year, as well as first to third year retention rate when compared to the other demographic groups, it's still the first two years account for 
the loss that does occur, the overwhelming majority, three quarters of the loss occurs for white students sometime during that time. So if we're gonna focus on improving so every student can graduate, yes, in a disaggregated manner, it matters for race and ethnicity, but also it matters in an aggregate manner for all students, including white students. If we're gonna improve outcomes for all students, we need to focus there. I don't wanna belabor this point. I can just say that the, uh, trend or the, 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 that I mentioned by race ethnicity holds true for first generation status. It also holds true for Pell eligible students, right? The big takeaways is that 74% of first generation student attrition occurs sometime during those first two years. And four out of five Pell students who leave higher ed altogether leave it sometime dur during those first two years. So the big takeaways is yes, race ethnicity matters. Family income matters. Starting out strong in the first two years, absolutely positively, is the key to making sure that you can move towards eliminating race, ethnicity, and family income as the best predictors of who succeeds, right? And uh, that's all here. I won't belabor it. So I do want to belabor this, though. I talked about transforming the foundational post secondary experience, and I defined what that means. For us, to live up to our mission or for you to do what you want to do at your institutions and as part of this broader cohort, you have to use evidence to innovate and design or redesign, reframe, right? Maybe move existing roof lines, definitely add on some new spaces or places, uh, maybe pouring new concrete and demolishing old foundations, redesign so every student can graduate. Now in our work, we've been influenced by Georgia Tech Center for Deliberate Innovation. And they talk about three forms of innovation. And we believe you'll be involved in at least two of those forms of innovation. Right? At a high level, they talk about reformative innovation. That's getting better at being who you already are. Right? That means you have a first year seminar and you improve on that first year seminar. Right? That's an example of reformative innovation using evidence to make modifications uh, so that you can get better at being who you are. The Center for Deliberate Innovation also talks about formative innovation. That's doing something that's never been done before. I will say CUNY, Stella, and Charles Gutman Community College is an example. They started a community college essentially from scratch, although they did it in the CUNY confines, right? Few of us actually have that luxury, but some of us do. That's why I pointed out the Stella and Charles Gunn. But we do have the opportunity to do transformative innovation. And that very much so is another form of innovation that we think you'll be undertaking in this work, which is doing something new within an existing construct. So you may find that you need to some, do something new and different that you haven't done before, right? It's not reformative innovation, improving on an existing first year seminar. It's adding a new structure or opportunity to what you're already doing, right? That, by the way, is often the hardest form of innovation because the statement, we've tried that and it can't work here sometimes or often gets in the way, right? What we're asking you to do is use evidence, maybe try something new, maybe bring something back that you tried before and wasn't successful, but you're going to do it now using evidence and using a task force model in a way that you didn't before. Right? And you, without those structures in place, that might be the reason why that wasn't successful. As you are successful with these efforts, we're gonna ask you to draw on the work of George Koo, Jillian Kinsey, uh, and remain positively restless. That is, you will build on successive initiatives so that one informs the other and the one that informs the other never fully goes away. As a matter of fact, it doesn't go away. It serves an intentional component of what you build on. That's why this is a five-year engagement. Truth be told, if we could have convinced the foundations and convinced purchasing agents, we would have made this a 10-year engagement, right? Because it's going to take that long to do hard work like this. But at the very least, we're working together for the next five years so that we can be very intentional about being positively restless and build on the successes so that your intentional whole becomes greater than the sum of the individual pieces that would be going on anyway, 
if you didn't have a framing opportunity like this. So I'm gonna wrap this up. And I know I went quickly. Uh, we will spend five years digging into this much more deeply, but our work together is about starting right here, right now. And in some cases, picking up on what you've already started to seriously move towards eliminating demographics as destiny, zip code, race, ethnicity, uh, family income is the best predictors of who succeeds within your institutions. And by the way, we know from conversation with all of you is that you share that commitment, you share that passion, that you all want to do that in your respective context. What we know uh, from our interactions with you is that you actually share many of the same dynamics and demographics. We also know you're all unique and different, right? So over the five years moving forward, we'll find sub cohorts within the cohort and you may learn from each other in ways you didn't expect. That's why you're doing this work within a cohort, right? But that's, that's our goal. That's what we're trying to do. Now, what Brent's gonna do, and so will Jill and Brandon uh, as they have an opportunity to share, which means I'm gonna stop really soon, is they're gonna go with you the myriad of ways that you can do that with us. Um, your way is the most important way. There is no one model other than us coming in doing initial or in Purdue Global's case, next time administration of a few surveys and evidence collection and going through a sense making process so that we can design with you, you can design for yourself with our help, the strategic plan to transform the foundational post-secondary experience. I want to thank at least four investors so far. There are a few more coming into this work, but Ascendium Education Philanthropies, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, ECMC Foundation, the Kresge Foundation, that have all invested in this work and have actually made it financially much more achievable for all 10 institutions that are in this initial founding cohort. There will be other institutions that are involved. And I will say your institution, you, are actually the greatest of the investors. Uh, yes, there's the monetary investment, but there's the investment of time, energy, commitment to this work. So we're very grateful for you and your involvement. I wanna wrap this up right now by going where I often go for inspiration. I, I like to think if James Baldwin was still alive that he might wanna hang out with me or at least let me hang out with, with him, right? But I am very motivated uh, and um, inspired by the writings and recordings of Baldwin. Uh, and one of the ones that I frequently go to was actually just a two page essay that Baldwin wrote in 1963 in the New York Times Review of Books. Uh, it's an uh, essay titled, As Much Truth as One Can Bear. And uh, in that essay, Baldwin was writing about the role and responsibilities of writers. But um, I like to think that Baldwin, being as brilliant as he was, really knew that he was writing about the roles and responsibilities of all of us in whatever we do, not just the role and responsibility of writers. Uh, but Baldwin, noted, as the uh, essay title implied, that um, it's the responsibility of writers to face as much truth as they can bear and then face some more. Right? I like to think those of us as educators, working as educators and education innovators and educators who want to see that all of their students can thrive and can complete, right? that it's our responsibility to lean into as much truth as we can bear and then some more, right? And Daska, if, excuse me, uh, Baldwin made this abundantly clear by um, referencing in the most succinct manner possible, clearly not in the way I'm doing it right now, <laughs> some of Dostoevsky's writings, particularly in The Possessed. And Baldwin noticed that Dostoevsky uses a small provincial town to really dramatize the, the state and plight of Russia the time that he was focusing on and about which he was writing. And Baldwin made the case that the particulars that Dostoevsky was outlining uh, and describing were not very attractive, but he simply used what he had, right? He was describing what he had in that small provincial town. Our particulars in this work, whether they're particulars that the Gardner Institute, as we're trying to improve as we do this transformational work with you, and your particular 
as you're trying to improve so that you can eliminate race, ethnicity, family income, zip code is the best predictors of who succeeds. Those particulars might not be all that attractive either, right? But they won't go away if you turn away. They won't go away if you don't know about them. As Baldwin writes and summarizes the end of that powerful essay, not everything that you face can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. We're here to work with you and work with and on ourselves so that we can face and change things so that we can move towards eliminating race and this thing and family income as the best predictors of who succeeds. We're grateful to be able to go on this journey and learn from and with you, help you learn about yourselves and you'll help us learn about how we can do this even better for other cohorts that will come in, other institutions that will come in going forward. So this is where I'm gonna end, which is the beginning, right? On some level, there is a reason why you call graduation commencement, right? It's because it is a beginning of sorts. And this is our beginning to the shared journey together around transforming the institutions and transforming the foundational post-secondary experience. And to get to those expectations or those hopes that you had, right? This is our big hope, our big why. But to get to some of that, now what are we gonna do, Drew? I'm gonna ask Brent to take it back and really get into the transformational model and get into the various and sundry things we'll do with you. And also let you know that we're not gonna all do it here today, right here, right now in the first 90 minute Leadership Academy onboarding. We'll be doing this over five years, hopefully maybe even 10, 15 years together because it takes that long to get these hard things done. But Brent, tell them what we're gonna do now so that we can move towards getting those hard things done. Back to you, Dr. Drake. Great, thank you very much, Drew. And I'm actually gonna turn it over to Jill because um, we wanna take a few moments. You've heard us talk about uh, or Drew talk about our big why and why we're engaged in this. And a big part of what's going to happen over these first three Leadership Academy meetings is getting you to focus around and think about what your big why is at your institutions and then how we're going to convey that out to your campuses. So as people talk about why are we doing this work? Wait a second, there's another thing you're adding to us. Aren't we already doing these things? You have a strategic message on this is why we're engaging in this and keeping that focus at your institutions. So Joe's gonna talk a little bit about how you're going to begin that conversation today. Thank you, Brent. So we're going to take um, the next five minutes or so and break into um, smaller groups. And um, you guys will just start the conversation here for your institutions. Over the next few weeks, you'll have space in the LMS to, to work on this and to think about it. And at the next um, Leadership Academy meeting, we'll dive more into this. But this is just the start of the conversation for your team to start to think about the why at your institution and how we're strategically going to send this message out to your stakeholders. So I've just opened the breakout rooms and you should be able to select your institution um, from the list that's at the bottom. If you scroll down there, you should see your institution. If you just click on the blue join button, you should be able to hop right in. I see people from Normandale already um, demonstrating how to do that. So. So let us know if you have any trouble getting into a breakout room and I can always assign you. If Francis and Tom, if you all wanna stay here, you can, or if you wanna hop into CSUSB, feel free. And Brandon, since Lori is here by herself for Alaska Southeast, I'm going to hop over there and uh, join her for a little bit in, in the discussion. Perfect. Thank you. And I'll see if I can assign Uma. Which one? 
There she goes. What? Oh, somebody else has. So we have somebody in the waiting room who doesn't appear to be on the list. So did Brent jump in with Columbia or where did Brent jump? I I went to Alaska. South Alaska. So okay. there's just the one person. Here, um, oh, I see you in there. Yeah. Okay. Welcome back, everybody. Um, hope uh, you had a good initial conversation uh, in your groups and, and thinking about this. Um, as Brandon mentioned, and we'll mention again a little bit uh, closer to the uh, end of our session here, there are prompts about this in Brightspace so that you can continue that discussion, thinking about both in terms of you personally, what your why is for being involved in this, and also for the institution, how those uh, uh, link together. And we're going to be doing a lot more work uh, in the first three academies here really kind of uh, honing that message down for, for the institution and talking about, okay, how do we broadcast that broadly uh, um, to really help drive these efforts. So moving on uh, from here for today, uh, Drew hinted at this and I'm, I'm gonna talk about a little bit more, our conceptual model of how we are gonna do this work over the next five years. And, um, Several of you, many of you, have uh, uh, seen this before, heard us talk about it in the info sessions, and you got just a very high overview of it in uh, our onboarding, but I wanted to talk about it in a little more depth here. And the point is, as Drew talked about that positive restlessness that we try and do uh, as institutions when we really hone in and do this work on student success, what we're trying to accomplish here is building that into the institution in terms of having a continuous improvement cycle of how you look at student success and do the work in it and do that uh, ongoing process really forever at the institution. It's about doing this over and over so you're continually looking at how you improve. Um, and that's what we're talking about in the conceptual model and our um, quality improvement cycle within it. What we're going to be focusing on in the first semester here, so, so the uh, first six months of this process and uh, really digging into in your fall semester, upcoming fall semester, is our initial stage of the contextual assessment and then uh, making a deeper analysis and choice of where we go in terms of uh, your student success efforts. So if you'll bounce forward to slide, Brandon. And what I mean by this is um, over the fall semester and a big part of what we're gonna talk about in uh, the Leadership Academy early on, first four or five sessions, is setting up that sense-making process on your campus that we will do late in the fall semester. Um, and to do that, we're going to uh, synthesize a set of information for you. Part of that will be um, our two instruments that we use in this process, the Institutional Transformation Assessment that really looks at your capacities on campus. And the other, the other is the Readiness, Willingness, and Ability Survey that are focused much more around your campus climate and culture uh, around transformation. And we'll combine that information with artifacts from you of major efforts on the campus, um, strategic plan, anything that is going in terms of uh, current accreditation efforts, major projects you may be involved uh, in because of statewide or system initiatives, and uh, why we've begun the data communicate, uh, excuse me, data process communications with all of you is because we also want to get that historical data into the platform for the fall so that we can also have a little bit of the historical data there to talk about it in terms of the sense making. And the goal of all of that process is that when we come through that, you look at and examine where you might have redundancies and where your gaps are at the institution, where you need to build capacity and where you already have capacity to do this work 
so that we build out jointly a five-year student success strategic plan with you. And to be clear, this is your initial five-year student success strategic plan because it really gets at how we're always doing that cycle over time. And from that, we'll decide, okay, where, where do you want to start as an institution? And then uh, spring semester, launch into capacity development around that based upon where you go in that sense making, whether that is around uh, greater data capacity at the institution, whether it is faculty development in terms of uh, course pe pedagogical redesign that can be done, whether it's um, more uh, capacity around your unit leadership on campus, like your academic department heads, or looking at your retention through more of an equity focused lens. We'll, we'll decide that you and your uh, relationship managers as a group, as you build out that plan and then dive into where uh, that goes. So we wanna advance the slide. That capacity development begins in the spring with the idea that in late spring or uh, summer of that year, we launch into a deeper redesign uh, process with you. And this is where we get into that plan and implement phase uh, um, within the wheel. Um, and this is where we talk about looking very, very deeply at some aspect of student success on your campus and um, aligning that in our services here at the Gardner Institute to help you redesign around that. Whether it is efforts around your first college year, whether it is your gateway courses doing um, pedagogical redesign within those, or looking at the curriculum as a whole in terms of your uh, um, general curriculum at the institution and where bottlenecks might be whether that is uh, looking at the second year experience at the institution. Again, that all derives from what we do in that sense-making as to where we go next. And when we launch into that process, typically that is a, a planning and, and initial implementation process that takes about a year at the institution to really dig in, build out your action plan, do your first phases of implementation with that. And once you've done that implementation, we then look at it and see what needs to be refined, see how we scale that up at your institution so that it's impacting the broadest set of students available. Um, and then we get into the rate and refresh, which I'll talk about in a second. But in terms of that uh, scaling up and where we go as an institution, it's about continuing to develop that capacity at your institution. It's about um, continuing to take those efforts that you began in this deep redesign and looking at what has worked in it, where do we need to tweak that? And as I said, scaling it broadly to the institution. To help you in that effort, um, we have in our platform, or I should say will have, because we're still uh, building it out right now, a set of both project management tools to help you looking at uh, milestones on your journey for how you're doing with this, as well as uh, metric dashboards to look at, okay, the impact of those things that we're doing, what does it do in terms of our population at the campus and how do we improve that over time? We'll also, we're not going to talk about it anytime in, in the next few weeks, but over the next few years, we'll talk about the idea of, as we're doing this with you, talking about maybe creating a national rating effort for transformative schools and what that would look like and what uh, criteria should be in that. And we would build that with you within this process. Um, but that's something we'll talk about more in the future as we go forward. But that gets us then into the rate and refresh. And what I, we mean by this is the fact that this is a cycle. It is a quality improvement cycle that goes on forever at the institution. So once we get through that initial redesign at the institution and we scale that up, we go back to what we did in that contextual framework at the very beginning and look at 
Have things changed in terms of the campus climate? Have things changed in terms of our capacities? Now that we are, it will be about two years into the process, two and a half years into the process at this point. Decide, do we need to do another administration of those surveys and see where our uh, sense on campus is with that? Relook at that initial five-year strategic plan we built together and say, are we still on the path we think we should be, or do we need to tweak that to uh, meet changes that have occurred over this time and what we've accomplished? And then we dive right back into the capacity development and the redesign of that based upon that plan. And this is really about continuing that over and over and over and building that into the culture of the institution. So this is how you always do this work in this space. You are constantly looking at yourself, looking at what are we doing very well in our student success? What do we need to build on? And how do we do that? And moving forward with that process all the time. So that at the point when Gardner steps out, this is baked in and you just continue to do this as an institution over and over and over to build upon that uh, student success over time. That is what we're not hoping, what we are going to accomplish over the next five years or fall of the year. It is what you are all going to accomplish on your uh, campuses over the next five years. And through that, we're going to impact what is happening for your students and improve uh, the experience and the outcomes for your students at all of your institutions. And we're very excited to be beginning that work with you. And we're very excited to have you all involved with this in, in our first cohort. Um, we've talked about the fact that we are going to bring in new cohorts each year with this. And um, while you have your initial community of practice here of cohort one institutions, we'll also add to that community of practice over time with those additional institutions. So you can all have this opportunity to speak to each other about, hey, what's working very well on our campuses as well. So it gives you that opportunity over time for us to do that. Um, so that's the big broad overview with this. In some tactical approaches on next steps, I'm actually gonna turn it over to Brandon to talk a little bit more about, okay, where do we go from here within the Leadership Academy and what are our next steps? And then doing a little wrap up for us here. Thanks so much, Brent. Um, so we've shared module zero with folks and following this meeting, um, you know, we'll, we'll share out invites to the next uh, four, four or so meetings related to the Leadership Academy. You'll see them pop up on your, um, on your calendars. We shared them in that module zero so you could hold the date, but we'll we'll get those on calendars now that we're getting lists from all the institutions of who will participate. Um, the meetings will be um, really focused on content, on getting the ITA RWA uh, started on your campuses, on looking at principles related to this work, and um, just making sure that, that you got everything you need to successfully move towards sense making by the end uh, of, uh, you know, I say that at the end, by midterm, uh, this year so that we can move toward that strategy plan as we get into uh, the end of this term and early part of next term um, into January, February. So just so that you've got an idea, and this is all in that syllabus and in that module zero space, but the first few meetings, you know, today we really talked about transformation as a process. We'll be digging into the six principles that, that um, we'd like to get some feedback on related to this work during the next meeting, which is uh, on August 8th. Between now and then, we're hoping you'll meet with your relationship manager and get started on looking at some potential dates for the sense making and continuing to talk about that that big why. There's a couple of other things on a checklist, but I'll, I'll jump into the to the bright space uh, page in just a little bit and show you some of that. Um, then we'll share a little bit about our why and talk about how we might develop a communication plan on campus related to the work. We'll get into the, the the sort of nuts and bolts of the ITA and RWA deployment as that time um, rolls around, which should probably be moving towards September, October of this year. Um, then we'll talk about the sense making process and what you can expect. Again, all this is, is going to be um, available to you digitally, but we'll have some capacity building time in the Leadership Academy. And then following sense making, you'll be working very deeply with your team and your relationship manager to design that five-year strategy. 
and we'll have a couple of meetings to facilitate and help with that. And then when we come back in the spring term, we're hoping to hear from institutions um, and ask folks to share that out so that we can we can learn where everybody is related to their plans. Um, so I'm going to pass things to Jill to talk a little bit about the ITA, and then I'll I'll jump back into um, a, a little bit about Brightspace and the work that needs to be done over the next couple of weeks. It's a pretty light lift, so um, so hopefully it'll be really clear. Uh, Jill, go ahead and pass it to you. Okay. Thanks, Brandon. Um, so I know that we'll dig more into this tool, the readiness, willingness, and ability tool, and the ITA in another meeting, but we wanted to give you a, a preview here. So here's a graphic that ELRC, the Evaluation Learning Research Center at Purdue University, helped us create when we created this tool with them. Um, and it just diagrams um, how readiness, willingness, and ability all works together um, to improve effectiveness towards um, re um, achieving your diversity, equity, and inclusion um, efforts and goals on campus. So this tool really assesses your institution's culture and climate. So the resources that you have and then the people power that you have to affect this change on campus. And then here's a diagram that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation created with their partners when they created the Institutional Transformation Assessment. And this tool assesses sort of the physical resources that you have on your campus that um, the Gates Foundation and their partners found necessary for equitable outcomes in student success. So they're more operating capacities and student success strategies that you have. So you have student success in the middle and um, the pathways that students take impacts that with the solutions areas and the operating capacities to create sort of necessary resources on campus for student success. And here are um, the areas that the ITA um, addresses. So if you're a two-year institution, two-year pathways, four-year pathways for four-year institutions, advising, digital learning, developmental ed, emergency aid. Um, and then it does touch on leadership and culture, but not as deeply as the RWA, we don't believe. Um, strategic finance, IR, IT, institutional policy, and state policy. So it gives your stakeholders a chance to assess um, where they think your institution is with each of these strategies that are necessary to support student success. And we'll get more into this and go into the specifics at a later meeting. We just wanted to do a quick introduction of the two tools that will be part of the transformation process. Thanks so much, Jill. And, and also just to let everybody know the recording of this session and uh, the slide deck, all of that will be available to you later this afternoon via our Brightspace uh, learning management system. So some things to think about if you haven't had a chance to look at them yet, you may want to peruse module zero, which is a lot of resources hyperlinked, including things like our transformation guidebook. Between now and the next meeting, we'd love for folks to take a look at the principles that are in there. That's called out in the LMS with page numbers um, and, and everything you'll need. It's only about two pages. Um, if you haven't logged into the LMS, we'd love for you to do that. If you need any help, just reach out. We'll be happy to help with that. Um, and then also, um, you know, just take a look at the, the Leadership Academy syllabus, which kind of outlines the work to come, um, you know, over the next few weeks. Uh, again, this is this is here in part as a checklist, but there's a checklist in the uh, in, in the LMS. We are inviting folks to, on a personal level, um, you know, take a pass at completing their personal why and also an institutional why, and then bring your team together to talk about that um, as your institution works to, to hone that and develop that over the next few weeks. Um, you can even make a recording in the LMS uh, if, if you like, but um, we'd love for you to do that. Um, and then start to, with, with your relationship manager, after you set up a time to meet with them, discuss a meeting cadence. You know, how often would you be able to meet um, with that person? Hopefully every, every couple of weeks. Um, and start to look at the ITA, RWA, and sense-making deployment checklist so that you can find those important dates, which are actually highlighted um, in, in, your, uh, in your project plan. So those are really the high-level things we'd love for folks to do. Um, and so with that, I'm going to very quickly just show you a little bit about um, what each of these things look like. Most everything you'll need to do, you'll be able to do by, by logging into that learning management system for now. Um, and when you log in, you'll get a slightly different view.
but these are the two spaces where you'll do most of, of the work over the next few weeks. Module zero, which you should be able to just hop into via this hyperlink. And it's taking just a moment to load, but there's the syllabus here, which you can go directly to, the transformation guidebook, which you can go directly to, um, your login to Brightspace, which is here as well, but you've gotten that via email, um, an article. If you'd like to learn more about the team or reach out to, to folks and you can't remember where to find it, Mod Zero's got it right here. You can just click on folks um, by, by, by their name. If you need to add folks to your team, um, please let us know that you're doing so, but you can go directly to this um, spreadsheet and, and do that. And then again, if in doubt and you're trying to get into one of these meetings in the future, you can actually go to the, uh, the Zoom link via these hyperlinks. So they're all here and ready to go for folks. Um, and we'll again, send those out to your calendars um, after today. And then just back out of this. Going back into the LMS, um, there are just a couple of assignments in there that are there via um, a checklist, but hopefully uh, they should be pretty straightforward and self-explanatory, but we'd love for you and your team to dig in um, to these checklists and make sure that um, you at least talk through these things with your, with your relationship manager. One thing that we would like to just call out verbally now it's so the very last thing here is that um, sometimes our emails get blocked um, and sometimes they don't, even to people that we know well. And so we'd ask that you and your, your team reach out to IT and make sure that we're on your safe sender list, both our jngi.org email addresses and the gardnerinstitute.org email addresses, um, which are new. And that's part of, we think, why, we're, why we may be getting filtered at your institution is because this email address is, um, in some cases, unknown because it's only been around for a few weeks. Um, so, so these are the, the high-level things we'd love for folks to consider working on over the next few weeks. And um, we're really excited to jump right in with you and your institutions. Um, we want to open the floor to any questions. We know that's a lot of information pretty quickly. Um, so do, do folks have any questions? Um, about what's been shared today, about you know getting into the LMS or what's going to happen over the next few weeks between now and our next meeting. Okay, great. What we're going to do is we're going to hang out for just a minute. If folks are ready to hop off the call, um, we just want to, again, thank everyone for joining us for the first of these meetings. We're really excited to jump into this work. Um, and your relationship manager will be reaching out to set some time to talk through the work that needs to be done. Um, but we're really just thankful for the time today, excited to get the work going, and um, we'll be in touch. And if you do have any questions and you want us to stick around, um, we'll be here. So um, thanks, everybody, and we'll see you soon.